Hello and welcome. My name is Joshua Castellino. Welcome to this seminar on uh, titled From Hate to Violence. This is a joint event hosted by Minority Rights Group International, the South Asia Collective, Article 19, Forum Asia, the International Commission of Jurists, and OMCT. Uh, my name is, is Joshua Castellino and I'm Executive Director of Minority Rights Group International and it really is a pleasure to host an event with some incredible speakers who I hope will take you through what, are, what is really a concerning phenomena, not just in South Asia, but across the world. South Asia has experienced some heightened incidences of hate speech, killing, looting, destruction of monasteries. Nepal as well has had its share of these kinds of events. Uh, Rohingyas have faced vilification. Mahadesis have felt, faced vilification. So we can see that this is a wide phenomena that really is a, a, a accruing across the world. And I just remind you that when the United Nations was formed, it was really formed to prevent the scourge of warfare that had already affected our lifetimes and that had decimated populations, particularly those on the basis of their ethnic identity. So it really is an imperative that we take this, take heed of the kinds of hate that is spreading among us and take active steps to, to counter this. And I wanna call on our first speaker, uh, UN Special Rapporteur, Fanon de Varen. Fanon, you've been a really firm advocate for pushing states and pushing international civil society towards coming to a greater realization of the scourge of hate speech. Would you please share with us some of your insights? Thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, Madam Special Advisor, Excellencies, distinguished experts, ladies and gentlemen, bonjour. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening also for some of you. Um, I'm delighted, first of all, I'm delighted to be part of this side event on preventing and countering hate speech and campaigns against minorities in South Asia, organized by MRG and the South Asia Collective with whom I've had the pleasure of collaborating and whose work I much admire. And I'm especially delighted and privileged to be again with Madame Alice Ndiritu, the UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide and other very distinguished experts on this panel. Um, let me first present briefly the main points from a more global perspective of hate speech and minorities, especially in social media, as this was, as Joshua has just pointed out, the thematic uh, uh, theme of my uh, annual report that I presented yesterday to the UN Human Rights Council. Then, with your, your permission, I'll focus on South Asia, obviously. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, you'll perhaps have seen or heard that yesterday I issued a warning that we, the international community, are failing. We're failing to tackle hate speech. And particularly, we're failing to acknowledge that minorities are facing a tsunami of hate and xenophobia, what I call a pandemic of the mind, and that the time has come for the United Nations to initiate a global process to regulate in a legally binding treaty what is a global phenomenon, with social media being able to funnel and fan the flames of hate almost, well, almost instantaneously to reach millions of people every hour of every day. Um, this would provide much needed guidance, clarity and consistency by being, well, first of all, a human rights centered approach that would have also two central pillars, ensuring first the proper understanding and protection of freedom of expression. This has to be first and foremost, but also at the same time, who appear to be overwhelmingly the main victims, perhaps three quarters, as a matter of fact, of all targets of hate speech in social media are minorities. And while the pandemic of the body, which is the scourge of COVID-19 is being addressed and maybe, well, let's say more or less under control this year, the hateful pandemic of the mind, which is hate speech, shows no signs of weakening. On the contrary, as my report indicates, hate speech in social media is spreading and increasing. We're being flooded. And unfortunately, uh, some would venture to say that this is particularly true in South Asia. One of the main messages of my report is that we're failing to sufficiently address and acknowledge this second pandemic, that minorities are overwhelmingly the victims of hate and incitement to violence and discrimination in social media. It's anti-Semitism to go beyond the region. It's also Islamophobia, it's anti-Gypsyism, it's the vitriol 
Creole, against Afro-Americans, against Asians, against Latinos, against Dalits, against Roma in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And overwhelmingly, all of those examples I just gave you are minorities. And we at the United Nations and in many countries may be failing by not naming and tackling specifically this, let's call it by its name, evil. The United Nations strategy, plan of action and guidance on combating hate speech actually doesn't really refer to minorities as being the predominant targets of hate speech. This is a gap. And if you don't focus on those who are overwhelmingly targeted and vulnerable, then how can you prevent hate speech? Not focusing on the main targets of hate speech against, which is against minorities, also means ignoring that the severest forms of hate speech can lead to the worst instances of violence, atrocities, and even genocide. I also warned that, the, that hate speech uh, faced by minorities is qualita qualitatively different from most other forms of hate on social media because, because the harm and violence it may lead to are in fact much worse. Remember, the Holocaust did not start with the gas chambers. It started with a minority. And that's the direction we're heading now. And I, if I expand South Asia a bit and include Myanmar, we have an almost perfect example of how, for a significant period of time, vitriol and hate spewed through Facebook against the Rohingya minority and essentially unchecked using dehumanizing language reducing members of this minority to dangerous pests, normalizing violence against them and making their persecution and eventual uh, uh, atrocities committed to them and that they were forced to leave the country in their hundreds of thousands for the sake of their own lives and safety. Do I have to remind you of the allegations of, the, of uh, so many Rohingya members of minorities being tortured, killed, burned inside their own homes of women and girls being raped. Evil has to be named and what we did not name the evil soon or strongly enough for the Rohingya minority of Myanmar was that they actually were the victims of hate speech and the violence that flowed from this hate speech against them in social media, namely, mainly uh, Facebook. Could it happen again in South Asia? Some would say it has already started. And here civil society organizations are playing a key role because governments in South Asia appear reluctant, uh, to say the least, to try to gather, for example, disaggregated uh, data on hate speech targeting minorities. Here I have to call out, uh, identify organizations that have been doing great work. The South Asia Collective, Avaz and Equality Labs have tried to fill the gap, at least partially. And the image they paint is deeply troubling, as indicated in my report. So without taking too much time, let me just quote a small extract of my report. In Assam, India, Vaz recently conducted a study of 800 posts on Facebook and found a preponderance of hate speech against Bengali immigrants who are openly referred to as criminals, rapists, terrorists, pigs, and other dehumanizing terms. These posts had been shared almost 100,000 times, adding up to around 5.4 million views for violent hate speech. Another similar India-wide study of hate content on Facebook conducted by Equality Labs provided a, back, a breakdown of hate content on the platform. 37% of the posts were Islamophobic, including anti-Rohingya uh, material, 16% constituted fake news, 30% targeted gender or sexuality, 13% targeted caste minorities, and 9% targeted other religious minorities." End of quote. The information I've received and some of the statements made at the UN Human Rights Council yesterday suggest that similar phenomena are occurring in Pakistan and Sri Lanka, mainly overwhelmingly against, again, minorities. Others here um, are certainly much more knowledgeable uh, than I am in the specific 
uh, national context um, uh, to explain what has been occurring, including, for example, in the events that we know about in Sri Lanka in 2018, which is, in a sense, is still continuing. Uh, and of the expansion of hate speech in other countries against religious minorities in Pakistan, in parts of India, where you have, my, once again, minorities that have, uh, where you have hate speech against minorities reaching, well, pandemic proportions, no pun intended. I apologize if I've been uh, focusing so much on hate speech itself and not prevention, but as I said earlier, evil must be named. And unless we recognize the nature and the scale of hate speech, and that the vast majority of those that are targeted are minorities, then we'll not be able to devise effective tools, measures, and approaches to face this pandemic of hate and uh, xenophobia. Uh, unfortunately, I've attended in recent weeks events ostensibly on tackling hate speech where minorities were essentially actually not mentioned except for my own exhortations. Now, hopefully that can change um, a bit in, if state parties and the United Nations, perhaps maybe also the special advisor and uh, myself can collaborate on this initiative, which is to take up the challenge of providing the guidance needed globally and uh, drafting more precisely, integrating human rights legal obligations in a uh, legally binding uh, document that are needed to protect, on the one hand, freedom of expression, but also absolutely minorities. So at the same time, um, this kind of global regulatory approach would hopefully limit what states can do in terms of overreach. As some of you know, where human rights defenders themselves are prosecuted and persecuted by state officials for defending the human rights of minorities, instead of dealing with those of the majority which post harmful, hateful, and even uh, violent harangues on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Evil has to be named, and then I will be finishing on a, a few uh, a small uh, comments here. Um, and it's evil that social media profit from hate, essentially as a result of the algorithms they use in their business models, which are among, by the way, these businesses are amongst the most profitable private enterprise in the world today with little or no financial liability or responsibility. This has to be addressed head on, as a matter of fact. No private business should be immune from, for the harm and violence which they direct contributed to. And we've clearly seen this in Myanmar and Sri Lanka. A global regulatory approach is needed to tackle this anomaly. So social media must be encouraged and assisted in also voluntarily fully integrating international human rights standards. And quite frankly, right now, they don't do that. I have actually started meeting with some of the social media to encourage them and collaborate with them on lifting up their game, changing, changing their community standards, and in fact, advising them on how to truly integrate human rights standards in their work, maybe with some small successes. <coughs> this should be, however, systematic. And the best way is with a global regulatory framework though um, I, I should probably mention that I hope to be working with the Working Group on Business and Human Rights together on specific guidance and guidances I'm preparing this year as a result of the regional forums in my thematic priority on hate speech, social media, and minorities. Joshua, you've been more than generous. Uh, I've much more to say, but perhaps I'll have to stop here and so that we can engage later, and especially so that others on the this this uh, distinguished panel have, who have greater understanding of the context and complexities of hate speech in South Asia uh, have the opportunity to present their, their wisdom and how to address these scourges, as you pointed out early in the beginning. Uh, merci, shukran, shukriya. Thank you very much, Farnan, for that very articulate and global overview and for the work that you have been doing. And, and those of you who, who want to hear more, please do. I really encourage you to get the report that was tabled yesterday because there's a huge amount of exhortations there to a range of actors that really, really merits, uh, merits attention to. 
as we come together to fight this evil, as you put it, Farnan, that, that lives amidst us, that affects majorities and minorities, but particularly, particularly targets minorities. Let's go to Sri Lanka next and, and hear from Farah Miller. Farah, you've been an activist and an academic on these issues. Could you please tell us about the situation in Sri Lanka, please? Thank you very much, Joshua, um, and thank you to Minority Rights Group International um, and to the co-sponsors for inviting me to this uh, panel. I also, would also like to welcome the special rapporteur's report. I've already read it, and it was a fantastic report, and I also um, appreciate your openness and certainly for uh, mentioning Sri Lanka so frequently in your report. I have some slides to share. Joshua, can you confirm to me that you can see them? Yes, I can, Farah, thank you. Excellent, thank you. My presentation and slide, bear with me. Um, my presentation today will be on hate campaigns against minorities in Sri Lanka, specifically looking at the country's 10% Muslim population. Um, I would like to start with uh, some introductory comments and context. So in 2009, now nearly 12 years ago, the then Sri Lankan government ended the country's armed conflict, defeating Tamil militants who were fighting for a separate state for ethnic Tamils, who are the largest minority group. Two UN investigations found credible allegations of violations of international law, including war crimes, crimes against humanity perpetrated by both parties in the last stages of the war. Claims for justice, truth, and accountability for tens of thousands of victims of these violations have been ignored and denied by successive Sri Lankan governments. Consequentially, the country is facing yet another resolution at the Human Rights Council as we speak. With much of the Tamil population defeated and dejected at the end of the war, the country's second minority group, that's Muslims, amounting to 9% of the population, began to be framed as the new enemy. Since 2009, Muslims have been subject to serious hate campaigns in public spaces, mainstream and online media. And this has resulted not only in hate crimes, but in consorted organized violent mob attacks as uh, the Special Rapporteur was speak, uh, mentioning as well. So my presentation today has three main areas of focus. The first is the functionality of hate. Hate speech against minorities is often part of a campaign that serves a purpose, which I will explore whilst also discussing the nature and methods used in these campaigns. Hate speech doesn't occur in isolation. So the second point will be to understand the relationship and dynamics of the perpetrator, especially vis-a-vis -vis the state. Finally, considering the above, to recognize the implications of hate speech, and here I'll uh, very briefly look at the UN framework on prevention of atrocity crimes. So let me start um, with some statistics. There you go. So this is uh, all gathered by an amazing organization called Hashtag Generation, uh, Generation Hashtag. Um, and you can see here these statistics. This is not to say that other communities in Sri Lanka do not face hate campaigns. My, uh, my, my presentation is going to specifically look at Muslims because that's where, which is my area of research. So here you see, based on the research done by this organization, Muslims are not only the target of significant levels of hate content online, but they are also the most targeted ethnic and religious groups. So these statistics are for last year. Right, let's look at the functionality. Hate campaigns soon after the war uh, ended in Sri Lanka were based on two broad, two broad claims that the community through population growth and economic power was set to take over the country. Now I found in my re research that even though these were based on ridiculous claims, such as for example, that Muslim business establishments were planting substances in the underwear of uh, women from the majority community to reduce their fertility, or Muslim restaurant owners were poisoning non-Muslims in their food. These were believed by sections of the population and used to mobilize uh, mobs uh, to attack well-known retail and food stores. The second line of attack was that Muslims enjoyed their own religious laws and were turning into extremists. The unfortunate Easter Sunday suicide attacks in 2019 where nine Muslim men targeted Catholic worshippers in Colombo hotels, killing 250 people, gave credibility to these claims as the entire Muslim community was seen to be extremists and collectively punished. Once again, with the pandemic, Muslims are portrayed as the super spreaders, accused of bringing about both waves and framed as a threat. So as you can see from this slide, 
the nature and content of this hate campaign serves a purpose of framing Muslims as a threat to the Buddhist nation, that's the majority communities, and to the state. These campaigns also function to dehumanize Muslims, as the special rapporteur was explaining, particularly with the content during the pandemic, which results in a, in a sort of numbing or a disinterest on the part of the majority population when Muslims and other minority groups are subsequently attacked or punished over these claims. If you look at, let me show you some of this. So this is, for instance, an image uh, that was popular on social media that portrays Muslims as terrorists or extreme, radical extremists. This was one that was, came out quite strongly to show Muslims as being the spreaders of the pandemic. The second point I want to make in this presentation is that hate isn't sporadic, impulsive or random. It is often part of structured organized hate campaigns. In the Sri Lankan case, these campaigns have functionality purpose and have led to violence or discrimination. Nationalist extremist groups from the majority Sinhala Buddhist community are often responsible for initiating these hate campaigns, but national mainstream media, political and religious actors are implicated in their spread. So in research I have conducted, for instance, in very remote Buddhist villages, people I interviewed suggest a web of authority figures behind the propagation of this message. Uh, when you ask them, for instance, why do you believe these rumors or why do you believe these stories, they will say they read it in the mainstream Sinhalese media, they will say they saw it on TV, they will say their son or daughter saw it on Facebook or another social media. In, uh, hate speech doesn't travel solitarily, it has accomplices. In such situations, we need to then ask, what is the role of the state, especially one that has a record of violating minority rights, stands accused of crimes against humanity and enables impunity for gross violations of human rights. Legal and regulatory measures are critical to preventing the incitement of violence and discrimination, but what happens when the government and state actors are associated with and involved in hate? In Sri Lanka, the Buddhist violent extremist groups that, uh, behind these hate campaigns against Muslims are not only unchallenged by government, but they are also at times actively supported. Muslims I have interviewed who were affected in religious violence in the south and north central parts of Sri Lanka have told me the police and armed forces offered no protection. In fact, watched as mobs attacked their homes and mosques. Sri Lanka's current government came into power through a campaign promising security for the majority that was entwined with increased militarism and targeted hate content on minorities portrayed as a threat. So if I move on to the next slide, you can see here in 2020 alone, some of the racist and discriminatory policies implemented by the government include, for example, the forcible cremation policy that existed throughout 2020, where Muslims were prevented from burying their dead in accordance with their religious rights, despite the WHO and national experts in Sri Lanka making a very clear statement that there is no, no, uh, no risk of uh, burial, no risk of the pandemic spreading through burial, but Muslims who died of COVID-19 were not allowed to bury their dead. And there's a number of other discriminatory policies and incidents of violence I've listed out in that um, on that slide to show you that hate campaigns are linked are to violence. Back? They are linked to discrimination. They are linked to institutional discrimination and discrimination that happens amongst uh, the public as well. Yes. Do you mind just changing the slide because we can't actually see that slide that you're referring to, I think. Right. I'm not sure okay. why that's. You're, you're not slide. able to catch any of them. You're on the right slide. Okay. Okay. Please. Yeah. I that's think I'm on the right slide. That's all right. Right. So, a recent report by Verite Research highlights a number of issues pertaining to the regulation of hate speech in Sri Lanka, including the lack of clarity in law and difference in interpreting interpretation of hate, for instance, when it moves from English to the local language. But again, I want to come to this critical point, and this is something that needs to be considered as well when we take into consideration the recommendations of the Special Rapporteur for the larger human rights framework, right? The critical question is, what happens when the government itself is so closely associated with perpetrators of hate campaigns, protects and supports them? So I want to conclude to draw on the UN work on prevention of genocide. I will focus on atrocity crimes. 
If you can see this slide, which I hope you can, Sri Lanka at the moment currently records, apart from one, apart from risk, risk factor six, every other risk factor, which acts as an early warning for atrocity crimes. So this is really very worrying. And I want to conclude with this point, which indicates a very fearful situation for minorities and one that no doubt requires the attention of the Human Rights Council, which we all hope will hopefully vote uh, in favor of the upcoming resolution against Sri Lanka. And I'm happy to take any further questions. I think I'll end there to let um, other panelists speak about other countries in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Farah. Well thought through and clearly presented. We much appreciate it. And the call, and I think it's a, it's really a pleasure to, to know that we have with us on this call the UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide and the South Asia team. So it is something that that office is particularly keen to look at and is, is paying attention to. So thank you for those words. And, and please, do, uh, uh, participants, if you do have questions, please do frame them in the question and answer session. And as we get to the end, after we hear from the special, uh, special advisor, we will get to some of those questions, I hope. But it's a pleasure to go then from Sri Lanka to Harun Baluch in, in Pakistan. And Harun Bites for All have been doing some tremendous work on digital literacy. But of course, you've also been tracking this scourge that is flowing through Pakistan. Over to you, please. Thank you, Joshua. And thank you, everyone, Farah, uh, Fernanda, and everyone from the MRG team and all the participants who are uh, who are participating in this all debate. And uh, I am uh, definitely going to talk about more in the context of Pakistan and the hate speech that is happening in online uh, spaces because uh, uh, we have been having a monitor. It's online monitor based on uh, based on the artificial intelligence technology and uh, machine learning. And we have been monitoring uh, a couple of uh, platforms uh, in Pakistan, especially Twitter and uh, Facebook. But uh, on Facebook, uh, most of the monitoring that we have been doing uh, is manual because of the privacy implication and all the uh, restriction that uh, Facebook has placed on, on the third party access to their platforms. But uh, yes, uh, uh, some selected groups uh, we have been monitoring that are actually very uh, uh, I mean, in, into this business of uh, spewing hatred against minorities in Pakistan, especially using the uh, social media platforms. And uh, um, our, our annual report, first, uh, second annual report uh, uh, is actually due uh, by, the, by the end of this month. And uh, you will see the, uh, the detailed insights from the, uh, from the Twitter and Facebook and other social media platforms. So some of the uh, context uh, that I would like to highlight is uh, basically the uh, the historic background of Pakistan and how Pakistan actually uh, plays uh, as, as as a state plays at uh, uh, at the global level when it comes to dealing with hate speech. Uh, I mean, Pakistan is a Muslim majority country, uh, and uh, not not like uh, India or Sri Lanka. So majority uh, hate is towards. Uh, minorities who are uh, actually uh, uh, other than Sunni uh, Muslim uh, 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 sect. So uh, for example, uh, uh, according to the study that we have uh, just concluded uh, uh, and some of the stats that I would love to share. So majority Facebook that we tracked on Facebook uh, is against the Ahmadiyya uh, minority who basically uh, is actually, I mean, I mean, Ahmadiyya themselves, they don't declare themselves uh, uh, as minority, they, 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 they declare themselves as Muslims, but because of the uh, constitution of Pakistan, they are clearly defined as non-Muslim, and that's why uh, uh, they face a lot of hate, uh, uh, not only in offline spaces, but only in the on online spaces as well. And they are the most... Uh, a vulnerable community when it, when it comes to discussing this uh, uh, hate speech and hate crimes in Pakistan. So uh, on Facebook, if I mention in terms of uh, figures, so uh, more than 50% uh, hate speech that we have tracked is against uh, against uh, Ahmadi community. And uh, the worst, uh, worst of the worst comments we have and worst of the worst conversation we have tracked, including uh, comments, for example, Vajibul uh, Qadal, which means uh, um, a person who is worthy to be killed uh, because of the blasphemy that uh, because they refer themselves as Muslims. So in uh, in in Pakistan, 
uh, their reference uh, for themselves as Muslims is also uh, at some times and, 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 and by some religious parties is dubbed as blasphemy. And blasphemy is, uh, uh, is punished in Pakistan with maximum punishment, like uh, under 295C. So, I mean, this sort of... Uh, a criminal, uh, I mean, a, a, a code, uh, procedural code uh, exists in Pakistan, which is very problematic uh, and that needs to be worked out as well. And then uh, when it comes to online spaces and the legal framework in Pakistan, so uh, again, hate speech is uh, criminalized in Pakistan under uh, Section 10 of uh, the cybercrime uh, uh, law in Pakistan, which very subjectively uh, defines the hate speech actually, and uh, yes, it mentions about uh, the uh, the uh, minor hate speech against minorities, hate speech against ethnicities, gender, and other uh, uh, groups. But it it doesn't gives a clear definition of hate speech. Actually, what uh, constitutes a hate speech? So that definition is missing. And when it comes to the implementation of these laws, so the 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 issue is that the these laws are implemented or uh, invoked uh, in very uh, discriminately against uh, those who, I mean, in, uh, especially if I, if I talk uh, uh, in terms of uh, Muslim majority, Sunni Muslims. So, I mean, uh, very few uh, cases you would find where like, you know, these sort of laws are actually uh, used, but actually these laws are misused against minorities. For example, I can quote a couple of cases from Facebook where, uh, like uh, 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 a couple of uh, cases where, like you know, uh, uh, young uh, young young uh, guys who who were actually exploring Facebook at the time and they liked a picture of Kaaba uh, on Facebook and and some of their friends on Facebook they found out that this Christian guy has liked the picture of Kaaba and then they registered a complaint against him that why a Christian is liking uh, um, the picture of Kaaba so it. It, I mean, this sort of uh, cases have also we have seen, and and actually the courts, the lower courts have criminalized uh, the, the victims of these sort of cases uh, uh, with uh, five years or three years punishments, and and I mean this sort of uh, 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 problematic uh, legal framework exists in Pakistan, and especially the discriminatory use of these laws. Uh, then I would also like to highlight about uh, other minorities, for example, in the context of uh, COVID. So uh, we have also seen uh, cases, especially against uh, uh, Shia Muslims, who are against uh, uh, basically a sectarian group, and uh, they themselves don't refer as, as uh, they, they don't like, like themselves to be referred as a minority. But uh, when it comes to discussing this uh, entire uh, issue of minority, so uh, we refer them as minority, but not, uh, uh, I mean, in that terms that uh, they are non-Muslims. So uh, we, we also saw uh, when, when the first case was uh, uh, registered in Pakistan, the COVID case in, in, back in uh, February, I guess uh, to be very exact, if I can recall the date was 26th February 2020. And those, uh, I mean, those people were actually coming from the Iran after uh, completing their pilgrim and when they entered, so uh, they, they turned out positive in Karachi. And then after that, we saw a massive campaign on hits, uh, of hit speech on, on Twitter and Facebook, where they were actually referred as Shia uh, coronavirus uh, uh, cases. So, I mean, this sort of uh, hit speech, we, we saw that, I mean, in, in that uh, context, they were, I mean, because they, they, they belong to uh, non I mean, they belong to not a majority Muslim group, so they were targeted in that way, and 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 they, and, and a lot of hate speech we saw where uh, uh, where all entire onus was uh, being thrown on onto that uh, Shia community the, that they are actually the uh, first ones who who have brought coronavirus in Pakistan, and there was no one behind. I mean, like you know, especially from the uh, state. Uh, site who, who who came to protect them. Then we've also seen cases, especially in the context context of uh, Ahmadis again, where state uh, officials were found involved in invoking or or like you know in, inciting people on Facebook, on Twitter, and even on mainstream TV channels uh, uh, against Ahmadis uh, that uh, they are. Uh, non-Muslim, a specific term is used for them, and that is called kafir. So they are infidels. 
so uh, and infidels uh, are again like wajibul qatl or uh, worthy to be killed so this sort of uh, things we have also uh, tracked on 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 platforms uh, which could uh, uh, um, uh, yield and actually i mean uh, specifically after this case where a state minister uh, ali mohammed khan was found involved uh, in, uh, uh, in in inciting uh, 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 hatred uh, against ahmadi so we uh, saw that there were at least 3 to 4 attacks on ahmadi uh, ahmadi uh, citizen in pakistan and one attack was in the court where a young guy came with a pistol entered in the court uh, and 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 fired at at, at the uh, at the ahmadi uh, uh, person who was actually at the court for uh, hearing of his case so and then again we also saw a couple of cases in peshawar where where ahmadi businessmen were killed one case we saw in punjab a doctor a young doctor he was killed in his car uh, by unknown people and definitely all these were the consequences of hit speech that were Uh, uh in online spaces uh, i would love to uh, answer more question if if you if you will have in the uh, later session but i think my 7 minutes time has just finished yes thank you very much arun for that clear clear articulation of it and for the work that bites is doing in highlighting these issues and trying to engage with social media companies we turn next to shakuntala shakuntala you've been doing a tremendous amount of work on issues of culture and media and social change would you tell us a little bit about the situation in india please Thank you very much Fanan Joshua Minority Rights Group and colleagues for this invitation. I'm well aware that there's far more to say than there is time for so I'm going to just very quickly try to go through the four or five different points um which lead up to suggesting ways in which we could combat hate speech. But I want to begin by outlining the socio-political context of hate speech in India if that's okay with everyone. In India and the diaspora just as in Sri Lanka and we heard now there is a widespread social prejudice against historically discriminated and marginalized groups such as muslims christians dalits and so on these groups have faced interminable violence over the years and this is embodied by a view of members of these communities as undeserving of citizenship sometimes a subhuman enemies of hinduism dangers to the indian nation polluted by meat eating promiscuous and treacherous or prone to terrorism these are simply summaries of the many many coded words that we have looked for in terms of the hate speech against these communities this prejudice which is inherent in many many of the uh, of the social spaces in which people live drives both socioeconomic spatial and legal discrimination and the spread of malicious orchestrated disinformation and hateful material on youtube whatsapp facebook and other social media platforms in india and i cannot like my colleagues here enumerate the number of instances these rumors frequently act as triggers and focal points of equally coordinated mob violence that is later characterized by members of the ruling party by the bjp the rss sympathetic media outlets as intercommunal rioting or spontaneous and proportionate responses to hurt hindu sentiments therefore the point i'm making is that the majority community defines itself pretty much in every media outlet as the hurt community even when the deaths are on the minority community sides since 2014 there have been more than 120 instances of public lynching documented in india and thousands of instances of attacks on muslim and christian communities for doing no more than celebrating someone's baptism or communion or going outside their houses to pray many of these incidents victimize individuals from discriminated groups particularly dalits muslims christians and adivasis and there are overlaps between these because many of the groups attacked are both christian and adivasi or muslim and dalit based on allegations of anti national sentiment impure touch attempted seduction of caste hindu women which is now known um, as love jihad cow slaughter cow trafficking and cattle cattle theft in a horrific incident a young muslim man who had a sacred number tattooed on his arm had his wrist and hand severed by a group of hindu men as he was traveling in search of work in another incident which brings tears to my eyes from just this last week a muslim boy who entered a temple to drink water was savagely beaten of course many dalits will know that they themselves are not allowed to enter temples in this manner the covid-19 pandemic also triggered ever newer allegations and more hateful material and action against muslims since the farmer protests began there have also been calls for violence even genocidal violence against sikh communities these are things which put these communities in clear and present danger 
Most of these incidents have in common mobs of Hindu vigilantes who use peer-to-peer -peer messaging applications such as WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and latterly also YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and ShareChat to spread lies about the intended victims and to use discriminatory misinformation to mobilize, defend, and in some cases to document and circulate images of the mob violence. This is done clearly as a warning and a threat to anyone else in those communities who might think of speaking up. It is this pride in mob murder and a lack of attempt to hide actions that in particular characterizes the recent spate of violence and social media hate about lynchings in India and wider anti-Muslim and anti-Christian violence in India. International and national human rights organizations who report and document the violence face increasing threat, harassment, and violence themselves from the Indian government and the police. Leaders of minority rights organizations find themselves imprisoned on false charges and face disinformation calling them proselytizers, and this is circulated very widely both in India and in the di diaspora. There is a growing atmosphere in our current work that we are doing on hate speech of fear and silencing amongst the, those who do not share these hateful views. I want to point out here the continuity between the mainstream media and the social media in the context of anti-Muslim, anti-Christian and anti-Dalit hate posts and violence. Hate speech, disinformation and incitement that circulate on social media and the diaspora are closely linked to hate speech, misinformation and disinformation that circulate via mainstream media. Many of these outlets have been pressured or co-opted, but many are also ideologically allied to the BJP and the RSS and their allies. There is a clear continuum between the formats and types of hate speech and content of posts on mainstream and social media in every language, whether English or vernacular. Everyday forms of hate speech and incitement are thus normalized and domesticated when mainstream media such as Republic TV or Sudarshan News, social media platforms and cross-platform apps such as ShareChat, TikTok, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp allow the perpetrators of these discourses, and I really mean allow them, to remain online and in public view, thus contradicting their own stated policies, as has been the case in India and in Sri Lanka in the last five years. Analysis of over a thousand forwarded WhatsApp messages in 2019 found patterns in the data suggesting that hateful WhatsApp messages work in tandem with ideas, messages, and stereotypes that circulate more widely in the public domain. A stereotype or narrative remaining um, clearly full of misinformation or disinformation, even when called out by fact checkers, is not therefore something that people are shunning. In fact, people are taking care to find verification of their false information through mainstream media. Ergo, there is nowhere you can go to actually confirm a contradictory view to the hate speech in India at the moment. Those who spread hateful misinformation in India clearly have political and ideological ties to the far right and to the government. The perpetrators of the tsunami of hateful speech against Muslims, Christians, and Dalits, and other minority groups repeatedly flout regulations on incitement to violence. I must emphasize how it is no point telling people to go to the law when law enforcement refuses to register cases against those making the hateful speech. During the Delhi pogroms of February 2020, when more than 40 people died, there were WhatsApp groups organizing the mass murder. Media researchers and journalists whom we follow and talk to talked about and showed how these hateful postings were being circulated online by groups such as the Qatar Hindu Ekta, a roughly translated as the Orthodox Hindus United. This was a typical group of the organized far right where members bragged about killing Muslims and dumping their bodies in sewers. I won't go on and I could show you some pictures, but I think they're very triggering. Attempts to combat misinformation and to instill media literacy are failing. The deluge of misinformation means that facts checkers have sprung up across the whole social media and mainstream media landscape. However, non-partisan fact checkers such as Factly, Boom Live, and Alt News are being overwhelmed by the sheer volume of irresponsible and violent misinformation against minority communities. It, there is a misplaced view that somehow just educating people in terms of media literacy will, will stop the systematic dissemination of anti-Muslim and caste-based misinformation. This is not going to happen simply for the simply for the fact that people know that what they are spreading is misinformation and they do it nevertheless because of an ideological allegiance to the Hindutva far-right cause. Artificial intelligence and other technical fixes which have been employed by Alphabet and Facebook have failed to lessen or eradicate hate speech online. 
wording and language morphs constantly and genociding, genocidal thinking disguises itself through the use of inventive metaphors and similes and more non-technological mechanisms for reporting incitement and hate speech on social media discourage further action on the part of those who have been targeted rather than on the part of those who are targeting. This is not entirely the case um, that it's the fault of those who write the policies, but it's more simply that there is a lack of will to put these policies into um, action. And we know that Facebook officials have their own connections to the far right in India. And this is very, very troubling for us. The waters around hate speech in India are further muddied by hundreds of thousands of false reports of hate speech, which are made by paid supporters of the BJP and the RSS against human rights oriented journalists, civil, so civil society activists and, and others. So um, you're swimming in a sea of disinformation and false reports about disinformation. Members of the Indian government and ruling party tacitly and openly support these hateful posts and posters. There is ample evidence that the circulation of disinformation and misinformation smearing pro-democracy protesters, which took place with the recent farming laws, the CAA and NRC protests, is celebrated on WhatsApp groups and Facebook profiles as evidence of commitment to the Indian nation. Therefore, it's very easy to make a mockery of those who ask international corporations to do the right thing, since it becomes apparent that any action to combat Islamophobia, anti-Dalit and anti-Christian content will bring those corporations into disfavor with the Indian government. So let's come in my last minute to some possible solutions to minority hates, anti-minority hate speech. International bodies like yourselves with the power to intervene politically and to take action against those in power need to acknowledge and inform themselves about the links between governments, ruling parties and hateful disinformation. They need to take action to ensure the safety of those communities who are being placed in imminent and likely danger by this misinformation. There need to be meaningful social and economic incentives from international law enforcement and international governance bodies to governments which take action against anti-Muslim, anti-Christian, anti-Dalit and more hate speech in India, Sri Lanka and the like, rather than ignoring it as is currently the case or in, in actually supporting it in order to increase clicks and likes. There needs to be equal powerful sanctions against those governments such as the Indian government and those media organizations which tacitly and openly sanction this kind of misinformation and hate speech. There need to be powerful business incentives from international law, law enforcement and government to platforms which take stern action against hate speech and disinformation. Twitter, Alphabet and Facebook as corporations, which together own half of the internet, urgently need to join the local and international human rights organizations and local state governments in India and the diaspora to ensure that all Indian and India related Google, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook employees undergo rigorous human rights informed training on what constitutes hate speech. This is currently not happening. And if it is happening, it's happening on such a small scale that it does not combat what's actually going on. The EU and the US constituted the Global Alliance Against Child Sexual Abuse Online to tackle a pressing and terrible problem against children. This has led to some significant gains in apprehending offenders. Any concerned individual in India should constitute a simple, similar body on anti-Muslim, anti-Dalit and anti-Christian postings and the circulation of inflammatory hate speech. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Shakuntala. The absolutely brilliant, if damning indictment of what is going on there. And thank you very much for the questions that have been coming through the question answer session. I encourage you to please put some more down and maybe we can start answering some of those for now. There's a number of questions there, I'm not going to repeat them because I think the, the panelists can see them, but perhaps give us some thoughts on some of the questions raised by our colleagues on the, on the, on the Zoom call. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joshua. And, and in fact, this has really been very, very uh, brilliant presentations that we've heard from the previous speakers. I, I think I'd like to emphasize or provide an answer in relation to business, uh, the need to engage the business businesses that are involved here. Um, we are dealing with social media. They are private businesses, and yet they control much of the area of speech that is, uh, that is available to millions and millions of us uh, through the internet. Um, what needs to be done? I actually think that, once again, to get back to the idea of a, a regulatory framework at the international level, we need to set out what are the limits here and what are the liabilities and responsibilities. And I emphasize a little bit the aspect of liability. 
I think for too, a too long period, and this is a personal opinion, I, sh I should say, that the, um, the social media business, businesses have, have, have had a free run. They have maybe been making a huge amount of profit without, in a sense, in total impunity. How this has been uh, able to be allowed to continue for, is rather striking to me. Now, there are different ways. There are carrots and uh, sticks and carrots that can be used. In terms of carrots, yes, I think it's important that we, that social media be engaged and encouraged to follow the right path. And following the right path is actually to comply with human rights standards. Um, now we just heard that it was suggested that uh, there should be human rights training for various social media. I completely agree. Uh, it's a very difficult task and it requires resources, but voluntary compliance is the first step. Um, I have started to be engaged with some of these uh, media, uh, social media platforms, as has the Working Group on Business and Human Rights. That has to be reinforced. But if I can make one caution, and I've seen this happen too often, there is sometimes human rights training that don't talk about minorities. How that's even possible, I find quite amazing, but that's a reality. So we have to be, once again, we have to focus continuously on who are the main victims, overwhelmingly, minorities. And unless you actually make a fundamental core center of any human rights training that you have on minorities, you're going to miss the boat. Because even right now in the exchanges I have, and I'll, I think I, I can mention this publicly, uh, that I have with Facebook, it's quite a hard struggle to make them understand that they have to focus on who are the most vulnerable and the main victims actually here. Uh, I, so that's one aspect. I think uh, just to emphasize uh, very quickly, liability. There has to be consequences to what they're doing, what, how social media can profit without any risk quite often of serious financial consequences. I don't think that can be allowed to continue. Uh, a regulatory framework I think needs to actually also focus on that. And thirdly, um, in terms of the uh, rights of minorities or minorities in this case, we need to actually work more uh, together to emphasize that minorities are the main targets and we need to focus measures, initiatives to address hate speech by focusing on minorities. And quite frankly, we're not doing it at the United Nations sufficiently. I, as I mentioned in my earlier presentation, I've participated in the last few months in a lot of events that are supposed to focus on hate speech. And I need to emphasize this, almost no one talked about uh, minorities. These are United Nations activities. And I have to continuously remind them of the importance on focusing where the harm is actually being done. We're talking about mass atrocities. We've heard some incidents, but the number of people who are being maimed, tortured, killed is stunning, quite frankly. So I think we need to actually admit, recognize what's occurring. We're not doing it enough. We need to deal with Thank it for that. with the United Nations and we need to work with other parties uh, in order to do so, to avoid atrocities. Thank you, I'm sorry, but I'm, this is extremely important and we are missing the boat at this point. Merci, Joshua. Thank you, Fernand, for that very, very clear call to action. Uh, uh, colleagues, we have about a minute from each of our panelists, and we are also delighted to welcome amongst us now uh, Alice Warimu and Derry to uh, UN Special Advisor on Prevention of Genocide. First of all, congratulations on your new role. We look forward to hearing from you in just a moment. But there's been a number of questions in a very active question and answer session. I'm sure you won't have time, colleagues on the panel, to address them, but give us a minute, if you would, on some of those, and I hope that this will just be the start of a conversation. Maybe start with you, uh, Farah. Thank you. Um, I am just going to add to what I was to what the other panelists said. So I take on board all the amazing uh, recommendations, all of which were great. But I think, from my point of view, the main thing is, uh, as I emphasised in my presentation, this issue when there is the a state a state actors and the government that's involved in these hate campaigns. So from my position, I think I, I totally support Fernand in his position to call out. I think we have to call them out when they're 
uh, involved in these hate campaigns, do more research, try to identify. I agree with Shakuntala that it's often where the majority community is portrayed as the victim because, of course, the minorities are dehumanized or considered as a threat in these hate campaigns. So it's really critical, particularly from the prevention of uh, genocide and the framework on uh, prevention of atrocities to make this point, to call out governments when they're doing this to call out their association with the majority uh, mainstream media, with social media ac actors who are involved in this. Um, and that I think is really important. And as I said, this has to happen at the national level. And we need to recognize that minority activists who are doing this are facing tremendous protection issues, right? You have in Sri Lanka, for instance, laws uh, enabling ICCPR, which are used against minority activists. They're not used to prevent uh, incitement of violence, but they're used to arrest minority activists uh, who are, uh, you know, who are expressing themselves through art and literature because it's considered offensive to the majority. So we need to call them out. We need to, uh, we need to point our fingers at the governments who are involved in this sort of thing, and we need to you do it internationally. And so again, my appeal at the Human Rights Council, Sri Lanka is on your agenda. So I hope that uh, there is strong international attention on Sri Lanka and action this time. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. Harun? Yeah, uh, a couple of things, quick things. Uh, I think uh, uh, UN Special Rapporteur has also talked about some of the problematic uh, uh, algorithms of the social media. They are very divisive. I think we need to engage with all these social media companies who are doing their uh, business by promoting these sort of conflict-free uh, uh, sort of uh, conversations and actually pushing these sort of conversations to relevant to people who are uh, more uh, this sort of who are actually engaged in more sort of this uh, uh, this type of uh, hate speech conversation who are who could be dangerous and and there are clear evidences uh, about that and not only from our side but uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, other groups who are also working globally on this and and. Uh, uh, I think we need to engage with uh, uh, Facebook and uh, uh, YouTube and then Twitter and all other uh, major uh, this uh, social media uh, uh, platforms to actually if, if because if if they claim that they are their their community guidelines and standards are against uh, hate speech and they don't tolerate any of these sort of uh, uh, commentary on their platform, so they need to actually show their clear will and uh, and and come forward. To actually curve and change actually their uh, uh, algorithms were very pre problematic. And the second thing is on part of uh, government. From the Pakistani side, uh, I would stress, uh, especially uh, when it comes to the diplomatic side, where Pakistan actually uh, is a coordinator of uh, OIC group at the UN level and uh, and speaks for xenophobia uh, and Islamophobia, and, and they have this uh, big agenda over there. They, they talk about all, all these sort of xenophobic uh, uh, commentary uh, against Muslims, but they are not uh, dealing the issue of uh, minorities, their own minorities, minorities who are living in Pakistan, Hindus, Christians, uh, Shia uh, 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 sectarian groups, Ahmadis, they all are actually facing. And, and we have also seen that Pakistan is playing very beautifully uh, when it comes to uh, to, to making uh, gains on the diplomatic uh, front by using the minor minority card as well. We have seen recently, I mean, less like uh, uh, less than a uh, year uh, back, we saw that Pakistan opened this uh, India-Pakistan uh, corridor for the Sikh community. It was just a political gimmick. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and there were political interest behind that that that's why pakistan facilitated that corridor but when it comes to dealing with actual uh, hate speech issues so uh, pakistan's response is very very pathetic we have seen that uh, state uh, individuals state people and authorities they are uh, found involved in this sort of hate speech uh, i don't know if you can hear me or not but i cannot uh, see you moving yeah, anymore thank you very much thank you harun shakuntala please yeah, I have I have two further things to say, which I think it's really important for groups around the world to remember when they are campaigning. One of them is that there are four groups that need to be constantly kept under 
um, assumption or, or, or in our gaze when we're thinking of anti-minority violence. One of them is the group of the majority community who are participating in that violence. The second one are, is the government. The third one is the international community of international governments. And here I think we, and, and, and the fourth one is the mainstream media across the world. So I think here we are actually failing um, South Asia because many governments in the West, including the government of the US, the government, many governments in the, in the EU, themselves come out with anti-Muslim hate speech. They, it, we are part, we're not separate from the world. South Asia is part of a large um, sort of phenomena, backwash uh, of, of racism. If you look at the comments made by, by politicians in France recently, you can absolutely understand how people in India feel empowered in their violence against Christian and Muslim minorities. So that kind of um, so disgusting confluence, if you like, between the, the hateful um, fascistic speeches of parties in, in the US and the UK um, actually um, serves the purposes of those committing violence in India. And the second thing to say is we need to start young. So both in the West and in South Asia, we need to have human rights literacy, political literacy, and, and sort of empathetic campaigns, not just media literacy and digital literacy going on from the time the children are five or six years old to counteract the influence of these hateful sentiments that are circulating in families. And if education is not absolutely at the center of your campaigns, funding it, supporting it, supporting human rights educators, then you're going to fail because you can't just have a stop it campaign without something to put in its place. Thank you very much. Uh that Joshua. Indeed. Yes, uh, Harun, we're, we're, we're out of time, I'm afraid, and we need to okay. hear from. So, so uh, Madam Bar Barimut, uh, uh, Deretu, it's a pleasure, as I said before, to welcome you to the role, and we really thank you also for the attention that your office has been paying to the South Asia region. We've heard some some fantastic research presented here in this side event, and it started off with Farnan asking us to call out the evil that is hate speech and to name the people who are facing it. And then our colleagues from across the across the countries, and it clearly showed that this is not about a Muslim or a Hindu or a Sri Lankan Buddhist or anything like that. These are lines on maps that have divided a humanity and now being used against that humanity in small little corners for political gain. I'm wondering if you could give us, from your perspective, I mean, the UN was set up to prevent the scourge of genocide that has twice affected us in our lifetime. And of course, it's manifest in the role that you play. And I'm wondering if you can end and give us some words for, to end this seminar with in terms of how we combat going forward. Thank you very much and um, much appreciated um, that um, you are holding um, this event. And uh, first I would like to apologize for coming in late. I was in another meeting uh, with the Human Rights Council and um, we, were all um, running from one meeting to the other and from here I'll go to another meeting, but that's the nature of the job that I am now doing. So I'd just like to thank you very much and um, really, really appreciate um, what I've had when I came in, uh, what I was able to hear. And um, thinking about um, this whole essence of, of framing it from hate to violence, um, how important that is. And as you say, rightfully, our office is uh, heavily involved in um, South Asia. We are doing a lot of work in South Asia. Actually, almost the majority of the work we're doing right now is in South Asia, and we intend to keep doing even more. So I'd just like to say it's a pleasure to join you today. And thank you so much, Minority Rights Group, for focusing on countering and addressing his speech in, in, in South Asia. So I, I previously worked as a commissioner in a body some years ago in a body in my home country called the National Cohesion Integration Commission, which is the um, only body that has legislated um, laws. It carries the act on, on his speech. And uh, so we did a lot of work around um, following up the exact things you've been describing right now. Um, looking at statements made by people, um, reading them, um, getting in legal experts to look at them and all other kinds of experts. You, it's so wide. These are the dynamics of his speech, including anthropologists would get them to look at um, the evidence that we had before we took the cases to court. And uh, you, you, when you speak about from hate to violence, I, I thought um, again, how often stereotypes, how often I saw stereotypes instrumentalized into actual hate speech and then hate crimes. 
um, that they begin with their stereotypes and then they grow into biases and prejudices and then that then uh, becomes the hate speech. And the hate speech, of course, by the time it's said, is because people feel that it's acceptable because they've been saying it over and over in their spaces, at their dining room tables and in other spaces. But then when they start getting affirmation, like for example, uh, what uh, Shaf Mutala just said about what she had in France and how that embodies uh, the people in India, like how, how powerful um, that is, completely, completely related. So uh, around the world, we're witnessing this very disturbing increase in hate speech and incitement to discrimination, hostility and violence, um, including expressions of racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim hatred, and attacks on Christians. And uh, I've worked in quite a number of uh, places where this is happening. So I'm not talking about a reality that um, is that I do not have um, real facts about. It's a reality that uh, even in the COVID-19 pandemic, when the world should have come together as we initially expected um, to fight this common enemy, we have instead seen hate speech and stigmatization flourish. And in particular, specifically online, with anti-Asian sentiments, as well as uh, conspiracy theories and scapegoating of ethnic and religious minorities accused of spreading the virus. So we know all too well the impact that his speech can have on communities and individuals. And uh, we also know that his speech makes those targeted more vulnerable to violence, exposes them to exclusion and discrimination and exhibits underlying social and economic inequalities and undermines social cohesion. We can't say that enough. So in the most serious cases, hate speech can also be a precursor to the commission of atrocity crimes, including genocide. And again, I say this as a fact because we know this from history. We saw it in the Holocaust. We saw it in the genocides in Rwanda and Srebrenica, where hate speech, deep-seated discrimination and dehumanization of the other were present years before violence started and atrocity crimes were committed. So countering and addressing his speech is therefore one of our most effective tools for prevention of, of genocide. Um, again, uh, we keep emphasizing that uh, because it's not often that people make the connection between hate speech and genocide, and yet it is so clear it's from one step to the other. There is no single genocide that has ever happened in our history that did not have elements of hate speech in it. So more. to these concerning trends within our societies and also globally. And uh, by addressing hate speech, we avoid escalation of tensions that could spill over into violence. Also addressing and countering such hateful rhetoric also helps to build societies that are inclusive and founded on non-discrimination and human rights, two other important ingredients in strengthening resilience to the risk of atrocity crimes. Um, and again, I say this because I come from a background of both human rights and peace building, which in many cases is usually an unlikely background, but I completely understand how important this is. In June 2019, in response to the global rise in hate speech, the United Nations Secretary General launched the UN Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech. And my office, which is the UN Office on Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect is the UN system-wide system, system -wide focal point for the implementation of this strategy. So the strategy sets out 13 commitments for action for how the UN can increase its efforts to address and counter both the root causes and impact of, of, of hate speech. Uh, we'll be happy to share this uh, document with you for you to see those 13 commitments for action. And in this context, my office also coordinates system-wide efforts to tackle hate speech, include, including by supporting UN field presences, member states, and civil society at international, national, and grassroots levels. Um, this also includes engaging with religious leaders and actors under the plan of action for religious leaders and actors to prevent incitement to violence, or also known as the phase uh, plan of action, named after the city in Morocco in which it was launched on their role in speaking out against hate speech. So friends, today uh, we all have a role to play in tackling uh, the rights in hate speech. Leaders, including political, religious and community leaders 
should use their voice to reject hate speech and promote inclusion, respect for diversity and peaceful coexistence. Governments also have a vital role in implementing policies and programs that address the root causes of hate speech. So in addition, I know from my own experience, um, the importance of placing communities at the core of action and the crucial role they can play in turning the tide on, on, on hate speech and discrimination. And I say so knowing that my predecessors did a really great job in putting together a framework uh, at the international, national and regional levels um, for the understanding of, 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 of the prevention of genocide. And uh, I come to this office straight from the communities um, where I feel very strongly that um, we have to place um, the, the role of prevention of genocide among communities. Uh, people have to feel very strongly at the community level that they own the agenda of prevention of, of genocide. And in that respect, bringing together civil society and community leader, leaders from different constituencies to share their experiences uh, like you've done today can help build trust and understanding and lead to innovative solutions to address divisions and tension. So the strength of community stakeholders lies in their in-depth knowledge of their context and therefore in their ability to recognize when divisive language is being used. It is important to support them to actively counter it, including with positive and alternative narratives, enabling policies, linking early warning to early response, improved information systems, and strengthened partnerships. So actions to support victims are also vital. It is particularly important that the voices of the marginalized, the minorities, and the vulnerable are heard. So this includes giving voice to the victims of hate speech and more broadly to marginalized or vulnerable communities, including ethnic and religious minorities. minorities. And I say so knowing that um, this should all be done while protecting and promoting freedom of opinion and expression and right to equality and non-discrimination. His speech will not be sold by limiting rights or shrinking civic space. Rather, we need to understand the root causes that allow it to flourish and work together towards overcoming them. In this office, uh, my office stands ready to support all these initiatives and uh, I cannot say um, how important what uh, this meeting is for us today in terms of ensuring that this happens. I look forward to engaging with you all, um, either um, together or as a group. Um, please, I'm available. You can reach out to me. We can reach out to members of our office. We can speak. Um, Fernando is, um, has a very close connections to our office. And um, he too knows ways in which we can work and partner together. And as I said earlier, that we are doing a lot of work in South Asia and um, really, really would like to continue this conversation going forward. And um, there are so many aspects of this conversation that we can take forward, including like what does legislation look like and on hate speech and if legislation exists, how do we ensure that it's not used? negatively, because it can also be used negatively to, to target the same, the very minorities it was intended to protect. So we can have further conversations on this. And, and I'm, I'm very, very glad that you invited me here today. Thank you very much. I look forward to a readout of what was discussed before I came. Thank you very, very much. And thank you, Madam, Madam Naratu, for that work and for the amount of times you use the word action. It's action we need colleagues blaming, Naming the evil, blaming the evil, holding the evil to account, but also searching deep within us for the hate that might lurk, that has conditioned into us and created us into boundaries and divided us into fates and all of these groups. Clearly, the only way we can combat this is together. It has been a pleasure to share this particular hour with you. Thank you for those of you who stayed beyond the time as well. Your Excellency is on the call. The Human Rights Council is there really to hold account, to act as a preventative and reactive body. So we really urge you to work together to combat this scourge and to eliminate it. It just remains me for me to thank uh, Special Rapporteur Fanon, Special Advisor Alice, Farah, Harun, and Shakuntala, and my colleagues at MRG, and of course, the South Asia Collective, OMCT, and the International Commission of Jurists Forum Asia and Article 19. We hope that you will keep up the activism towards eliminating this. This is within our reach. We need to collect and get in touch with our own humanity to create the better world that we all aspire to. 
Thank you very much.